So my lab uh, is sort of motivated in, in large part for this, uh, uh, with this overall question of how do cells know who they are? Um, obviously, every cell in your body has the same genome, but there's this incredible diversity of uh, 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 phenotype, uh, bone cells and blood cells, and there's these incredibly complex organs that get uh, generated somehow from this single uh, genome uh, of information, and uh, you know, there's an immune system that is, can be weaponized and attack different parts of the body. Again, taking instructions from a single uh, uh, a copy of, of the genome, and, and to be a little facile, in some sense, one analogy can be, obviously, every cell in your body has the same hardware, the same uh, double helix uh, uh, genome, but there's a, a sort of a computational layer that runs on top of that, which is the epigenome, the software layer that is really encoded in the nuclear protein structure of uh, that genome and is a physical instructions, uh, sort of sequestering parts of the genome away and keeping different parts accessible. And just to give you a little a taste of what the cell is dealing with every day, uh, obviously, uh, here's a cell. Uh, here's uh, the nucleus of a cell. It's about five microns in diameter. If I took the DNA out of that nucleus and stretched it out, how long would it be, everyone? OK. It would be about two meters long. It would be as tall as I am, all compacted and sequestered into a five micron nucleus. So that's sort of an incredible problem that's equivalent to taking a telephone cord. Who's seen a telephone cord before? That's sort of an ancient reference. A telephone cord and, uh, that stretches from San Francisco to New York uh, and compacting it and folding it into a, uh, something about the size of a normal two-story house. So that's uh, really, really challenging. In the end, the cell sort of uses maybe a couple percent of the genome uh, as these regulatory elements that tell it what uh, parts of the rest of the genome that are, are, need to get used. And again, here's sort of a hand wavy description of how might that work. We have brain cells and lung cells and blood cells, and there's these uh, regulatory elements we like to call enhancers that are either on or off in some sense. They're on, they're driving gene expression of proximal genes, and of course, oops, this is driven by the binding of transcription factors. These proteins with uh, DNA sequence specificity that like to bind, make regions accessible, and drive gene expression. And my lab uh, likes to look through this lens of accessibility. So which parts of the genome are uh, open to the machinery of transcription and bindable by transcription factors, and which parts are folded and compacted and sequestered away and likely off and not regulatory? So my lab, in collaboration with Howard Chang, driven forward by Jason Benrostro, who's now at Harvard, developed Attack-Seq. Okay, so it's attack, well, I like to say Attack-Seq because the transposase is attacking the chromatin. It isn't attacking the chromatin. Okay, no offense to people who pronounce it differently. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. But uh, we say Attack-Seq, the way this works is the transposase goes in and uh, inserts a sequencing adapter into regions of accessible chromatin. Uh, you isolate those fragments and immediately sequence it. The assay is the library prep, effectively. Regions of accessible chromatin uh, get uh, uh, enrichment in the, in the sequencing that you do. And you can also uh, deploy this at the single cell level uh, in multiple ways, both uh, in Fluidime and 10x. Uh, and I would say that in some sense, uh, looking at the single cell open chromatin landscape is one instantiation of what Waddington conceptualized as the hematopoietic, er, as the, this differentiation landscape. Who's seen this picture before? Everybody, yeah. So this is the idea here is you're a ball rolling down a, a landscape. You have mul a high potential to be different cell types. And as you roll down, you become more and more lineage committed. Uh, in some sense, this open chromatin landscape is some instantiation of that conception. Uh, you can see here, uh, if, as we project the open chromatin landscapes of individual cells, here is a hematopoietic stem cell sort of basin, and these cells transition into lymphoid or erythroid or myeloid as they uh, differentiate into the different blood trajectories. Uh, this is a much more continuous conception of what you might see in a, a textbook where there are different cell types defined by immunophenotypic markers on the surface. Uh, here, for example, you can see the CMPs are much more heterogeneous than they would, uh, uh, would, they, they would appear in this sort of simple model. The uh, immunophenotypic markers really mark cells that are very erythroid-like, very myeloid-like, and actually also very, very HSC-like. But who's seen this next picture? That is the next picture in Waddington's book, perhaps the more interesting part of this analogy. These are the guy wires that are pulling that landscape, rolling the ball down into different uh, lineage commitments. Um, and they are sort of meant to uh, represent transcription factors that are, again, binding at different locations and driving gene expression programs that uh, determine that cell fate. And we can also uh, get a sense of what those uh, transcription factors are doing in these single cells by asking about the accessibility associated with specific DNA motifs like HOXA9 that is high in this hematocrit. 
hematopoietic stem cell compartment, uh, or ID3 turns on as you go to lymphoid, or GATA, or CBP beta, a master regulator of this uh, myeloid commitment. So we can get some insight into the uh, transcription factors, or at least the, the motifs that are driving these lineage commitment. Uh, and actually, by scaling up the assay with uh, 10x, we can also generate tens of thousands uh, of cells, both in the single RNA space and the attack seq space. And you can see these are independent data sets from peripheral blood and bone marrow. So here is the uh, bone marrow region. Here's the sort of more peripheral blood in the RNA seq space. And the attack seq space, you can see very clear correspondence between these two in some sense. The thing on the left is the molecular, uh, is the sort of the what of the molecular phenotype. And at some level, the uh, attack seq is in some sense the why of why those genes are being expressed and which elements are uh, driving those expressions. I like to say that these two data sets are very highly complementary. Um, they're, more, they're more powerful together, much like peanut butter and jelly. But it turns out nobody outside of the US eats peanut butter and jelly. So is that right? So nobody knows what I'm talking about. I, I, I said gin and tonic for the British. But uh, maybe, maybe Xiaolongbao is the right thing. So you got dumplings and soup, and it's better together. OK. okay. So what you can do then is take hematopoietic, you can uh, look at a continuous trajectory uh, in the open chromatin landscape, starting from hematopoietic stem cells and going all the way to B cell, plasma B cell differentiation. Ask about the, the uh, open chromatin elements and how they change across this differentiation. You can see these wonderful elements that are very dynamic and open only for different uh, sort of short windows during this differentiation from hematopoietic stem cells to plasma, uh, plasma blasts, basically. We can also sort of make pseudobulks and sort of watch the movie of accessible elements changing uh, over this time frame. We can also do nice things like ask about the motif accessibility associated with different transcription factors, and then also look at the accessibility around the transcription factor start site for the gene expressing that transcription factor, which of course correlates with uh, the motif accessibility very uh, generally. So we get really nice data about uh, differentiation uh, across these timescales. So but we, uh, how can we use this data to potentially interpret mutations, which is obviously still a challenge. Uh, quite often, if you see a mutation, a de novo mutation, if it's in a gene coding region, Region, you can kind of start to interpret it. If it's in a non-coding region, it's very hard. And actually, the vast majority of mutations occur in these non-coding regions. So uh, we wanted to try to tr try and understand the effect of non-coding mutations on uh, developmental pr processes. So we uh, partnered with Sergio Pasca and others to generate uh, open chromatin data across a human fetal brain development. So uh, here again is the peanut butter and jelly, the Xiaolong Bao of the, uh, 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 the, the two uh, views, the open chromatin landscape and the single cell RNA landscape. Here we're starting from sort of uh, uh, the stem cells and differentiating up here into uh, more mature neurons. And the same is true here in the open chromatin landscape. Uh, and the nice thing we can do is make these pseudo time trajectories and look, for example, here at accessible elements nearby the genes that correlate with the expression. So we can nominate the regulatory elements that are driving gene expression changes across this differentiation trajectory. We can also nominate which motifs are driving these changes across this pseudo time trajectory. And also, sorry, these are the motifs. And these are, this is the expression of the specific genes that express proteins that bind to those motifs, which we nominate as uh, the actual causal elements, uh, proteins that are driving this expression. Uh, we also see that regulatory uh, tra transcription factors that drive sort of uh, lineage deciding fates tend to have lots of enhancers associated with them. And those enhancers correlate pretty well with their gene expression. So this suggests that these uh, lineage defining factors are actually highly regulated. They've got lots of enhancers to tell them to turn on when they turn on and probably uh, are concerted in their uh, sort of effects. So we uh, collaborated with Anshul Kandaji to use neural networks actually to try and understand the specific bases driving accessible changes. And so what you can do is give the sequence of the gene to this neural network and force it to try and predict the base resolved accessibility that we observe in these different cell types. And then once you have this model, you can actually use it to make sort of in silico mutations and prioritize de novo variants that might be ablating different regulatory elements. Um, so what does that look like? Well, we can train a model. Here is the reference allele. It thinks that this NPY uh, or this motif here is really, really important for maintaining accessibility. There's an individual who actually has autism that has a mutation right here that ablates that uh, uh, 
that motif entirely and is predicted to have very strong effect on the accessibility. We can do this in a cell-specific manner and ask if, if there's an enrichment in the cases for de novo mutations versus controls uh, in, these, uh, in these stem cell populations or more fully differentiated, in differentiated uh, neurons. And actually, the most interesting thing is if we look at all mutations in autistic spectrum uh, patients versus their controls, there's about the same number of de novo mutations. If we just overlap the mutations with uh, all of the open chromatin peaks, we don't get any enrichment. But if, if instead we use this uh, uh, neural network trained model to prioritize mutations that are highly uh, disruptive of chromatin accessibility, we get a huge enrichment of mutations in patients with autistic, autistic spectrum disorder over their controls. Actually, this is the scale of uh, enrichment similar to what you would see in actually uh, uh, mutations in coding regions. Uh, and if you do things like overlap with fetal heart peaks, you get no enrichment. Or if you use a BPNet model trained on fetal heart accessibility, it doesn't work either. So this is very specific to the models trained on the fetal uh, uh, developmental uh, data sets. We can also do this in things like cancer. Uh, here, we've done it in TCGA, where we have uh, 73 different tumors and maybe 200,000 cells, uh, attack seek across 10 different uh, cancers. Uh, and actually, you can see here, if we just naively do a UMAP, the different cancers don't really cluster with one another. All individual patients cluster individually. And that's actually because of copy number changes. There's big copy number variation. And that drives the variation in accessibility, because it's sort of linear in accessibility. If we re regress all of that out, we actually see that the, the clusters come all together, and actually the underlying uh, trans regulation in the different cancer types is actually very, very similar, which is what you might expect. But you can actually use this copy number uh, variation to do interesting things, like here <coughs> in this uh, glioblastoma patient sample, we have two different clones that we can see with copy number changes here, or three actually. We can see clone B, C, and A, and here uh, are the different deletions and amplifications across uh, those different clones. And then we can do things like take uh, single cell data sets from fetal uh, here, uh, or sorry, fetal here or adult, and project those individual cancer cells into that manifold and ask if the cancer cells in the different clones that have different copy numbers are more or less uh, like fetal or uh, uh, adult cells. That is to say, are they more stem-like or less? And actually, the different clones have very different uh, projections. This guy is much more uh, fetal, and this guy is much more adult. And that may be because SOX4 specifically is on chromosome 6, six and we, it may be, it's amplified on that clone B and maybe driving this uh, more stem-like state. So again, we can do the same trick of uh, training neural network models and then trying to predict, and uh, first of all, they give us insight into differential regulation in the different cancers. So here you can see luminal cancers versus basal cancers. Here is an SP1 motif that the models are predicting is always there. Here's a FOXA1 motif that is predicted really only to be important in luminal cancers, and that's consistent actually with FOXA1 expression high in luminal cancers and low in these other cancers where the model isn't really saying that it's important for generating the accessibility at the site. So now we can take, for example, TCGA and PCOG uh, whole genome data sets, identify 130,000 somatic mutations, run them through these models to predict how important they are for potentially disrupting uh, regulation. And when we do that, again, if we just look at all mutations and overlap, now what we're doing is asking, are the, are the mutations close to uh, TCGA-like uh, important genes, or are they far away? If we look at all mutations, there's no enrichment for these uh, regulatory uh, mutations in cancer-related uh, cancer genes versus away. But if we use our model, we can get very large enrichments. And uh, here's just one example that's uh, relevant to some of the talks we've heard about, TET2. Uh, here is a, a, a open chromatin element near TET2, and it's predicted to be ablated by a mutation in cancer, likely uh, causing uh, less accessibility and potentially down regulation of TET2. So we think we're seeing strong uh, evidence for driver mutations in regulatory non-coding regions uh, using these uh, uh, deep learning models. Uh, the last thing I wanted, to, or <laughs> one of the last things I wanted to talk about was adding this third layer of uh, uh, gene regulation, trying to link regulatory protein abundance to the epigenetic and gene expression changes. So obviously it would be wonderful to try and understand the, the actual concentration of proteins, how uh, they uh, open chromatin accessibility and drive gene expression all within single cells. And there's been a lot of uh, work about this, our contribution, 
uh, was actually using single-stranded binding protein. So one of the, oops, one of the big, sorry, one of the big problems uh, when you're trying to assay protein is that you do this with a DNA-linked antibody, and oftentimes this big piece of DNA is a big negatively charged thing, and if you look at the antibody uh, versus a protein you're trying to quantify, like GFP, you, oftentimes if you don't protect that big negative thing, you get no correlation between the antibody and the protein. But if you add SSB to hide that uh, D, big negative charge, you get beautiful correlation. And so we've done this and looked, for example, at transcription factor uh, levels. Here we can see accessibility, RNA, protein, and the motif accessibility. Sorry, this is accessibility around the gene promoter, and this is accessibility around the motifs. Uh, and for example, for these transcription factors, there's sort of a, a correspondence between the expression, the protein levels, and the motifs. For these transcription factors, there's anti-correlation actually with Helios and the abundance, uh, uh, the accessibility at the motif and the abundance of the protein, likely suggesting it's a negative regulator. And things like GATA, we see that the RNA is sort of all over the place, but the protein and the motif accessibilities agree, likely suggesting there's post-transcriptional regulation. Okay, I'm gonna skip this slide so that I can get to this. I wanna introduce you to uh, the great American sage, Yogi Berra. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk a little bit more, more about physics-y things. <laughs> um, Yogi had this wonderful phrase, many, many wonderful phrases. One was that you can observe a lot by watching, which sounds silly, but it's actually very deep. Uh, and we were excited to use uh, molecular methods to try and understand the specific molecular states at a regulatory element and try and understand if we could get a quantitative uh, model for how, for example, transcription factors, where if you add them upstream of a gene, there's lots and lots of uh, papers that suggest that this is a highly cooperative thing that happens. You basically get no expression for one copy, but you get enormous amounts of expression once you get above a certain threshold. So why is that? If you go from DNA, um, number of motifs to expression. There's lots of hypotheses about how that might happen, including cooperativity and competition. Um, we wanted to say, well, what if we could actually measure the transcription factor and nucleosome occupancies uh, at this level? Can we bu build a sort of stepwise understanding of how DNA sequence relates to the molecular substates uh, and then how that brings out expression? So we've been building this uh, along with Lacrobintu, this nice system where we have RTEDR VP48, a synthetic transcription factor that we can induce with docs that'll come and bind different numbers of these engineered transcription factor binding sites and we get this beautiful cooperative behavior in expression. So this is uh, much, we recapitulating what people have seen. But uh, now what we're doing is using this single molecule footprinting uh, approaches that basically take uh, uh, sort of a methyl transferase, uh, it, they can methylate accessible cytosines and then you can read them out with sequencing. And so if you think about it, these different molecular states imply very different footprints on the DNA and perhaps we can build up an understanding of sort of all of the microstates that are occurring uh, at an enhancer and then how those microstates relate to uh, expression. So here's just an example for five different transcription factor binding sites. You can see immediately that uh, basically uh, here are individual single molecule traces. And very quickly, if you stare at this, you can uh, uh, uniquely assign the molecular states. Here is five transcription factors bound. Here's three bound and two free. Here's a nucleosome and a transcription factor. So we can uh, identify what the states of binding and enhancer are. We can actually also identify different promoter states, including a state that does not have a nucleosome around the promoter, which we're going to call active, and then uh, states that have nucleosomes covering the promoter, which we're going to call inactive. Uh, and then when we do this in bulk, we see what we would have expected. When we don't induce the binding of a transcription factor, we see basically uh, protection everywhere. And when we do, it sort of turns on. But of course, we have single molecules we can look at. For example, here is eight transcription factors uh, bound, and you can see here's one bound, and here, and here. Every row now is a different single molecule. And we have that now for all of our different constructs from zero transcription factors all the way up to eight. Um, and if we look, for example, at seven, we can actually figure out the m fraction of molecules that have different transcription factors bound to them. So this is the underlying sort of statistical mechanical distribution, the partition function that you observe. And so since it's a partition function, we decided to start modeling it with energies. So we have a transcription factor binding energy. We have a nucleosome binding energy. Here are the microstates. We can use the Boltzmann distribution to predict what's going to happen. And it does not work. So what does that mean? We need to make our model a little more complicated. Remember VP48 has something that is, uh, VP48 attracts things like chromatin remodelers. 
So if we add a chromatin remodeling term that reduces the, the binding of the nucleosome energy when the remodeler is present, we actually can fit this data perfectly, I would say, it fit, or it fits very, very well. Um, and so that suggests that the remodeler is actually helping the transcription factor bind. So what we did was cut off the VP48, which is the component of the transcription factor that recruits that remodeler. And when we do that, we would predict that we, we should be able to fit this now with just a two-state model where there's binding energy and nucleosome binding energy, and that actually works great. So we think we understand the statistical mechanical uh, sort of uh, 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 the, the underlying biophysical parameters that are causing these different uh, molecular states at the promoter. So let's turn to the, uh, uh, sorry, at the enhancer, let's turn to the promoter. The promoter is really interesting. I don't have time to get into all the details, but we can identify active versus inactive states. Again, across different uh, transcription factor, uh, across different bind numbers of transcription factor binding sites. So what we can do is take our molecular model of the number of transcription factors bound across different, uh, uh, the number of copies of that transcription factor binding site, and we can then relate that to the occupancy. So if you look at the fraction of promoters active, it's actually pretty linear with the average number of transcription factors bound, which was a surprise to us. There's really no cooperativity there. Every additional transcription factor just directly adds to your ability to open the promoter. And it turns out that the number of promoters active is linearly proportional to the gene expression as well. So much of the, almost all the cooperativity we think is driven by this sort of cooperative binding through chromatin remodelers and not by cooperativity at the promoter uh, or, or uh, uh, and, and, and sort of this observation is that promoter activity is linear in gene expression. So again, we have this partition function model. We can actually explain from first principles, we think, uh, pretty well the uh, expression that we observe. Uh, and um, we're excited to do other experiments, which I'll get into. Report, so we have a reporter system for connecting measurements of TF occupancy and promoter state. The TFs compete with nucleosomes through independent binding aided by these activation domains which recruit nucleosome remodelers, which effectively reduce the uh, energy of binding of the nucleosomes themselves. The average TF occupancy can linear relate to gene expression, uh, so most of the synergy we think is due at this TF binding step and not to the uh, act activation of the promoter, at least in our system. And we can do uh, other things like change the TF concentration and ask if this potency does changes or not, and it doesn't, which is, makes sense. Still, even if you have a lower concentration of TFs, the number of TFs bound specifically is linearly proportional to the fraction active. Uh, we can also inhibit BAF and P300, which actually reduces the potency of uh, the transcription factors themselves, and actually also, in the BAF's case, makes it harder for them to bind. Um, and we can look at things over time and other things. So we're really excited about sort of unraveling the microscopic states that are driving gene expression. Uh, and here's my lab. I, I got to specifically call out Michaela and Julia and Ben uh, for driving forward all of the, the molecular state footprinting stuff. And sorry I went a little bit over, but hopefully we have time for a little bit of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.